Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm Nat Edwards. My name, uh, sorry, my name is Nat Edwards. That's who I am. Uh, that's a good start. I am the Director General and Master of the Armouries. We're really, really pleased to be hosting um, the Olaf Palmer Memorial Lecture. Um, Olaf Palmer is a, a fascinating character. It's so fitting that, um, that this lecture is, is held in Leeds. He was a, a, a prominent uh, campaigner for, for justice, for peace, against imperialism, against oppression, and also against sitting back and saying nothing when you had to do something. He was the um, Prime Minister of Sweden from 1969 uh, 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 to 1976, and then from 1982 until his death when he was assassinated in Stockholm in 1986 and somebody who testifies both to the importance of campaigning for peace, but also of having the courage to, to, to challenge some of the most difficult situations. So, you know, it's really important to remember people like Olaf Palmer, but it's also really important to remember the connection with, with Leeds and, 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 and the fact that Leeds was one of the first places to recognize that importance. He, he studied here uh, briefly in the 50s, and for that reason, Michael McGowan, MEP at the time, um, uh, in the year following his, his death, uh, instituted the first Olaf Palmer Memorial Lecture. And since then, uh, from, from Olaf Palmer's uh, 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 widow, Elizabeth Palmer, through a host of really important and interesting speakers, I'm not going to list all of them, um, there's plenty of information about that, but everybody from John Hume to, to Claire Short to Patrick Stewart, the you know, captain of the Enterprise, um, <laughs> Uh, through to Bruce Kent and, and many, many others, I think some at least of whom are in, in the audience today, have, have, have delivered this lecture uh, on subjects ranging from chemical weapons to Marcelo Bielsa uh, and everything in between. And on that theme of how you find the conversations, the courage to say difficult things and to make a difference. And that's why it's really, really important for us to be hosting the lecture tonight and why it's really, really important for me and a delight to be able to um, welcome Clive Barrett as our speaker. Now, Clive is the chair of the Peace Museum. He's also an executive member of the International Network of Museums for Peace. Um, he's a writer, a prolific writer. Some of his books are outside. Um, he's also a contributor to a piece in the Age of Empire, to um, Blackwell's Companion to Religion and Peace, and a forthcoming, really exciting uh, work which he's co-editing, Museums and Peace in Search of History, Memory and Change. Basically, th there isn't a better person to be talking about the subjects of peace, museums, and the object of peace and the object of change. So I'd like you to give a really... Oh, I should say just before I do, that this, this lecture has been organised jointly by Leeds Beckett University, Leeds City Council, Leeds Peace Links and Yorkshire CND. But it is our delight to welcome tonight Clive to the stage. So can you give him a massive round of uh, applause? Thank you very much. Thank you, Nat, and thank you for, to the Armouries team for enabling this event this evening, and thank you, friends, for, for coming. I'm going to start, I hope, with some music. <laughs> An excerpt from Mozart's Sinfonia Concertante in E flat major by the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, co founded by the late Edward Said 
and the conductor Daniel Berenboim. The orchestra brings together young musicians from across the Middle East to literally be in harmony together. Berenboim asks, do we now surrender to this terrible violence and let our striving for peace die? Or do we continue to insist that there must and can be peace? My answer is in this talk. I saw the charred Iraqi lean towards me from the bomb-blasted screen, his windscreen wiper like a pen ready to write down thoughts for men. His windscreen wiper like a quill he's reaching for to make his will. I saw the charred Iraqi lean like someone made of plasticine. Part of a 1991 poem, A Cold Coming, by the Leeds poet Tony Harrison. It alludes to the highway of death, the Basra Road from Kuwait, and the massacre of defeated, retreating Iraqi forces, mainly conscripts, sitting targets for UK and US airstrikes in February that year. Around what we now call the first Gulf War, I'll mention the second one later, I was actively involved in the Leeds Committee to Stop War in the Gulf. We were a small coalition of peace and political people with highly divergent world views. None of us had any sentiment for Saddam Hussein and his invasion of Kuwait, but neither did we think that the West response motivated by oil profits, should be war against the Iraqi people, themselves victims of Saddam Hussein. There would be no justification for slaughter on the Basra Road. We did the usual campaign things, speeches and rallying outside the art gallery, demonstrating in the city centre. And that demonstration struck me for the puzzled looks we were getting from shoppers and passers-by. Why were we demonstrating? Not hostility, just indifference. What was our problem? We were on a different wavelength, no connection at all. For an anti-war message to get through, for peace voices to be heard, Demonstrations alone would not be enough. The culture was wrong. As Tony Harrison said later in that poem, but cabs beflagged with sun front pages don't help peace in future ages. Stars and stripes in sticky paws may sow the seeds for future wars. Each Union Jack the kids now wave may lead them later to the grave. There needed to be fundamental, societal, cultural change. We needed to work on the long, slow development of an underlying culture of peace. And non-violence, it seems to me, is often synonymous with patience. And patience and peace go together. Building a culture of peace is not a quick fix but a work of patience. And in what follows, I want to look at cultures of peace, the birth of a peace museum, our collection, and finally, on releasing the future. Cultures of peace. Leeds has a rich peace history. Too much to go into now. Stories include one of the first women's peace groups in 1820, an active Leeds Peace Association in the mid-19th century campaigning, for example, against war in the Crimea, an amazing Quaker, Quaker from Adol, Isabella Ford, who stood up for the rights of Tayloresses, 
and led demonstrations against the First World War and many others. Some of us once produced a Leeds Peace Trail. An update is long overdue. Leeds is not unique in this. Everywhere has its own peace stories. Often hidden for decades or centuries, their rediscovery can help build a local culture of peace. Michael McGowan already knew the importance of peace education. And four years before that Gulf War, in 1987, he was instrumental in setting up the Olaf Palm Peace Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Michael. And Olaf Palm, seen here demonstrating against the war in Vietnam, as we've heard, was a Swedish Prime Minister. He pioneered a conference for security and cooperation in Europe. He convened an independent commission on disarmament and security. And they produced a concept of common security through cooperation rather than deterrence. People can find real security. You only feel safe when your counterparts feel safe. And those were heady days for peace. People power and mass civil disobedience brought down the Berlin Wall. There was hope that East and West would have a common European home. And the Olaf Palm lecture in 1990 was given by the future Nobel laureate John Hume, who reviewed prospects for peace in Ireland in the light of the fall of the Iron Curtain. Increased cooperation between European countries, he said, did not dilute sovereignty, but dilate democracy. Ireland, like Sweden, was neutral, and Hume referred to NATO, quote, whose relevance is more questionable now than previously. A charter of Paris, signed just before Hume's lecture, declared that the courage of men and women, the strength of the will of the peoples, have opened a new era of democracy, peace and unity in Europe. In short, common security. And I criticise the culture of 1991. In some ways, it was better than today, and in other ways worse. Cultures change. The dominant UK culture has moved in the direction of narrowness and nationalism. That is not inevitable. It is for us to transform our culture into one that upholds values of inclusion and peace, social justice and mutual respect. Cultures of peace are essential foundations for common security. The preamble of the UNESCO Constitution recognised that peace must be founded upon the intellectual and moral solidarity of mankind. Sick. Since the late 1980s, UNESCO has promoted the concept of a culture of peace. The values, attitudes and behaviours that promote freedom and human rights and reject violence. We all have our differences. Conflict is an essential part of what it is to be human. It helps us change and grow. It's how we handle conflict that matters. Resisting temptations to other those with whom we, are, we disagree. Respecting the essential humanity and worth of every human being. Our mutual respect, the way we interact and communicate with each other, our shared spoken and unspoken assumptions, the overlapping of each, of each person's and each community's identity, the things we celebrate together and the things we abhor together, the things we choose to remember and the things we choose to forget and the futures we strive for. These all weave together into a culture of peace. It embraces peace education, history with music, arts, theatre, dance, anything that contributes to an environment 
in which people flourish without violence. In all this, peace becomes a verb. The way in which we move towards our goal, less an end than the means we use. How we travel determines our destination. How we get there is what we achieve. The means become the end. And a peace museum can be one of the foundations on which a culture of peace is built. The birth of a peace museum. At the turn of the 1990s, I chaired a small religious peace group, the Anglican Pacifist Fellowship, part of what's now known as the Network of Christian Peace Organisations. I met a Quaker, Gerald Druitt, secretary of the Give Peace a Chance Trust. Gerald spoke about plans for a Bradford University conference on peace museums. A peace history lecturer at the School of Peace Studies, Peter van den Dungen, specialised in peace museums around the world. I was already doing a PhD in peace movement history, realising that the same campaigning that we were doing then had been done by generations before us that there was a history of peace movements. There was strength and encouragement to be found in peace history. Vertical networking through time, inspiration to be found in stories of women and men who'd stood up for peace and resisted war. Stories I never learned in school. I went to that Bradford conference. And the iconic statue on the right of the screen is Reunion Reconciliation by Josefina Vasconcellos, is one that has been copied in Hiroshima, Belfast and Berlin, a part of the Bradford story that's gone around the world. The conference made two decisions. One was to start the international network that Nat alluded to earlier, and Peter van den Dungen was its first coordinator. It's now known as the International Network of Museums for Peace. Note that phrase, museums for peace. Purpose matters. And if you want to know more, that rather expensive book, I'm afraid, Museums for Peace, In Search of History, Memory and Change, comes out at the end of the year. The other decision of that 1992 conference was to pursue a peace museum in this country. A working group considered sites in London and Leeds, then settled on Bradford. The local authority, especially a future chief executive, Dave Kennedy, was was supportive The School of Peace Studies would be a valuable academic resource and the diversity of the city was seen as a positive feature. The museum would be national, even international in scope, but locally rooted. And late in 1993, with a a Leeds Quaker, Marion McNaughton, I collected the keys for a small office above the Wool Exchange in central Bradford and the National Peace Museum project was born. A part-time worker was appointed, I chaired a steering committee, and we took advice on what was needed to start a museum. We learned a new language with phrases like accreditation and accessions and collection policy. We had big ambitions and two strands of our work. I called them being and becoming. Being meant getting on with the day-to-day business of being a small independent museum, holding a collection, documenting it, caring for it, displaying some of it to the public. Becoming meant working with larger partners, persuading them that what they really needed was a peace museum. And a series of Bradford schemes included a huge university peace and conference centre, 
Bradford ideas, though, ran out. So how about a partnership here or with Leeds Metropolitan University, as it was then, for an even grander International Peace Museum Centre next to Civic Hall in Leeds? The financial crash put paid to that. More Bradford schemes came and went, and none of these becoming schemes, where we depended on someone else, ever came off. Meanwhile, the daily business of being a peace museum slowly changed us. Our first temporary exhibition was here. A vision shared, art from the history of the peace movement, was a glimpse of what might be possible. We tweaked it as a set of portable exhibition panels, and for years we relied on touring panels, on Nobel laureates, women peacemakers, Yorkshire peace, faith and peace. Our first solo exhibition was in 1997 in Thornton, where we combined artwork from Peggy Smith, who sketched peace movement leaders of the 1930s, with a local diversity project on Bradford peace stories. It was a great combination of think global, act local. There's a verse by the poet John Milton. No war or battle sound was heard the world around. The idol, spear and shield were high up hung. Would that all spears and their successors were high up hung in museums. And we continued to look for opportunities to cooperate with others, even unlikely others, and produced that small permanent farewell to arms exhibition that I hope you've seen upstairs in the War Gallery. Also, the Yorkshire Air Museum once had an exhibition on the adrenaline buzz apparently felt by the air crew that bombed Hiroshima, ghastly concept. But we partnered with them on an adjacent exhibition on artwork from Hibakusha survivors who showed us what the real story was, the real horror was, at ground level. Unlikely partnerships. We had a pop-up banner exhibition and provided banners for British textile exhibitions. We displayed campaign materials at Abbey House in Leeds and had a mock World War I conscientious objector's prison cell at Leeds City Museum. A pop-up gallery told the story of German women who helped to bring an end to First World War. And you can see on the right a, a poster from Katie Culvitz, Nivida Krieg and No More War. Objects from our collection, especially banners, are regularly loaned to the V&A and the Tate and other national galleries. The museum developed an engaging education programme for schools, both on site and off, reaching schools across the north of England. Sessions ranged from key stages one and two. A popular workshop at this time of year is, involves the production of different coloured poppies through to more challenging post-16 engagement of difficult issues, addressing, for example, online far-right extremist propaganda. In 1997, we obtained our own space in central Bradford at the confusing address of Peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, Peace Hall Yard. <laughs> With three exhibition rooms, it had potential, but one huge drawback. It was up 60 stairs. Not good, maybe tolerable for, as a temporary solution. 25 years later, we've still not fully moved out. We had permanent and temporary exhibitions there. There were Jewish voices from the Holocaust, a display on no pride in war. There were some wonderful sketches by Jill Gibbon, 
an artist who blagged her way into arms fairs to record the blasé normality of merchants of death. Which begs the questions, who profits from war today? In whose interest is it for wars to go on and on? And where are the voices of peace for ending war, for saving lives? One of the most successful exhibitions in terms of visitor numbers was a project on peace after partition in which families divided by the trauma of India-Pakistan in 1947 came together for peace 70 years later to recall their diverse yet not so diverse heritage. But we were getting crowded we needed to move out of Peace Hall Yard. Its lack of access was not acceptable. We'd outgrown it in every way. There's no room in our, for our exhibition programme to flourish, no room for our expanding collection, not nearly enough room for exhibitions. But moving would not be easy. Anywhere else would be more expensive, and we had to start fundraising to get the reserves to make a move possible. Then came COVID. The museum closed. Staff still managed to curate impressive online exhibitions. And we were even shortlisted nationally for the small museum with the biggest social impact. We kept looking for future solutions and were thrilled when we found the new space we wanted. And we decided not to open again after COVID and to concentrate on the move. It's been a long, frustrating time and for legal reasons, we couldn't say where we were going. But at last, this summer, we made our big announcement. The Peace Museum is moving to salts. Oops. Saltaire is a model village built around the River Eyre and the Leeds Liverpool Canal with workers' housing, a church, education spaces, and parkland. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and described as an exceptionally complete and well-preserved industrial village built in a harmonious style, an outstanding example of mid-19th century philanthropic paternalism. And it was all the idea of a rich mill, mill owner, Sir Titus Salt. Bradford was full of textile mills, mainly specialising in worsted. Salt made his fortune that way, but the city was dirtied, the air was polluted, and his workers had poor health. So in the 1850s, he built Saltaire, with streets named after himself and his family. The workers' educational and spiritual needs were met as long as they behaved, so definitely no alcohol, and worked in his huge new mill, the double-edged hallmarks of paternalism. 100 years on, trade had decreased, the mill had closed and begun to fall into disrepair. And in the 1980s, local entrepreneur Jonathan Silver bought it up and slowly but surely, he and his family transformed salts into an enormous arts and retail centre. It sells beautiful things, and all under the watchful eye of Titus Salt. It ha houses the major UK galleries of Bradford-born artist David Hockney, and it attracts around half a million visitors a year. And because it's so vast, not all the space is taken. Some spaces have not been used since the building was a textile mill. 
they are still to be reclaimed into a peace museum, for example. We are working to transform this empty mill space into a fantastic peace museum. It is accessible. It's much bigger than what we had before. We'll have education space and we'll show more of our superb collection, which has been hidden for far too long. Our collection is, has already moved and is in new premises, no longer cramped and impossible to access. It is in ord well ordered and in good conditions. And I would now like to explore some of our collection. The collection began with a set of campaign posters originally used in an exhibition in London. When we started to record objects in an accession register, the first item listed was a local authority tourist poster from an era when political messages were banned, but tourist advertising was permitted. <laughs> Bradford Metropolitan Council's poster showed high withings on the Bronte of Moors above Haworth with the anti-nuclear caption, visit Bradford before bits of Bradford visit you. And the unique feature of the Peace Museum, giving our activities and education programs their authenticity and authority is our collection of 16,000 objects, the tangible heritage of peace. We hold the peace of the past. Our objects are peace. Our stories are peace. Through the collection, we address issues of peace and war resistance in the past, illuminating issues of peace today, and empowering those who will grapple with issues of peace in the future. For our purposes now, I'll divide objects thematically into small objects telling big stories and asking big questions, objects making peace, activist memory and protest, culture of peace. And lastly, I will address why remembrance is not enough small objects and big stories. This suitcase was carried by a Jewish child refugee from Nazi Germany, escaping on a kinder transport programme to the UK. We use a replica in schoolwork. What would you put in a suitcase if you had to flee quickly from violence today. A Nagasaki tile shows the imprint of the atomic explosion, a small shadow reminding us of the immense power that must never again be used against human beings. And our fragment of the Berlin Wall has, is a double symbol of hope. First, that walls can come down, and secondly, that fragment was originally retrieved by a peace group from Belarus, reminding us that even in countries that today are regarded as pariah states, there are still people like us, people of peace. Objects help us to ask big questions, such as, what is peace? A Roman coin from around the year 280 depicts the goddess Pax, and the inscription is Pax Org, the peace of Augustus. It speaks of the human longing for peace through the centuries, but Roman peace was based on brutal violence on the edges of empire. 
to what extent is our peace based on faraway violence today? A painting depicted on a 1919 card celebrating the end of war shows peace or does it? Passive children, lambs, a rural idyll. Isn't non-violent action for justice and equity also part of what is the meaning of peace? It's a flawed picture, but it opens up a big debate. Objects may not always give answers. They can open up questions too. Peace changes as its, its meaning as our attitudes change. Objects relate to William Penn, 17th century Quaker, radical thinker about how a council of Europe could prevent war on this side of the Atlantic, and on the other side he made a peace treaty with Native Americans in what is now Pennsylvania. We even have an obelisk made from the wood of the tree under which the treaty was signed, a bit like the Berlin Wall. A great peace hero, or for some, another colonizer who kept slaves. How do we handle complex peace stories and flawed peacemakers? the place of law in making peace. We hold on loan some key historic documents in the development of international law and institutions of peace. On the left, in the 17th century, Hugo Grotius revived the philosophical concept of just war, which has developed into a key component of international law never been much of a fan. The very name is problematic. Every despot with a trumped up excuse claims to be fighting a just war. But in theory, a just cause is only one of several considerations ad bellum for going to a war. Is it the last resort? How will it end? Will it be better? And as for conduct in Bello during war, is violence proportionate, not a sledgehammer to crack a nut? Is there discrimination between combatants and civilians? Too often today, the significance and worth of human, especially civilian life, is disregarded. Maybe we do need greater knowledge and respect for just war criteria, and this old booklet is highly relevant. And at opposite ends of the 18th century, philosophers Saint Pierre and Immanuel Kant wrote formative books on the structural means to achieve a permanent peace in Europe, and their ideas influenced the shape of the European Union. And yes, they were right. It has maintained peace within its borders in a way previously unknown, for which it was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012. And from the early 19th century, we can talk about organised peace movements on both sides of the Atlantic. Early documents here include an account of pacifism in the first three centuries of Christianity, and reprints of Erasmus, the great European apologist for peace in the 16th century. Continuing with attempts at peace through law, we hold a copy of the doomed Versailles Treaty of 1919, and various items refer to the League of Nations or the United Nations and its agencies. These reflect the importance of international law and respecting institutions for peace. We note the le legacy of Nobel, including the influence on him of Bertha von Suttner, author of Die Waffen Nieder, Lay Down Your Arms, who persuaded him to add a peace prize to his bequest. And amongst our Nobel Prize giving related items are menu cards from Nobel Peace Banquets 
showing the laureates' certificates. Those shown poignantly reflect 1994 Voices for Peace in the Middle East, when the laureates were Arafat, Perez and Rabin. The theme of peacemaking moves to relationship building and reconciliation. Some objects not only depict transformed relationships, they help to achieve relationships in the way they were made. A red Mothers for Peace quilt depicting a bridge, a peace symbol, consists of panels made by women from different nations in the 1980s from both sides of the Iron Curtain. I love the image on the left of the bridge of a teapot as a symbol of peace. And a map of India before partition in 1947, made by Lak consists of dozens of tiny cloth scrolls, each holding the story of a family caught up in the killing spree and mass migration of that time. The scrolls come from all sides, all communities mixed together, as they share common human experiences of fear and flight. Bradford has a large South Asian diaspora and the map has brought together in harmony families whose ancestors would have been enemies. My title, and our objects, our peace, a culture of peace is our object, is a play on the various means, meanings of the noun object, as artifact and as objective goal. But of course, the same word is also a verb, leading to a juxtaposition I once saw when behind the Leeds Memorial to the human cost of war, a partially hidden, partially revealed sign on the Henry Moore Gallery, go object, seemed like an imperative to protest against war. The Peace Museum holds lots of material about civil society protest. We not only honour the big names of peace, but also stories of ordinary people like yourselves making a stand against war. The Peace Museum is a registered charity, not itself a campaigning body, but we tell the stories of people who are. We won't sign your petition, it's unlikely we will make a public statement about world situation, but we might tell your story. Stories from the past include items around the First World War, on the founding of the Women's International League in The Hague in 1915, about British conscientious objectors. Here's a, an oil painting, The Conchi by Arthur Gay, showing an arrested conscientious objector under military escort. And at the bottom is an autograph book with entries from conscientious objectors in Wakefield Prison. It gives their stories and the verses which inspired them. Here, a Bingley conscientious objector lists his prisons and work camps with a quote from the American poet James Russell Lowell whose work inspired many minority conscientious objectors and war resistors. They are slaves who dare not be in the right with two or three. And a triptych for sculpture from a relative of a Yorkshire conscientious objector, John Brocklesby, calls for support for all prisoners of conscience. Earlier, we upheld international law, and here we recognise that national laws can be wrong. Standing up for peace may mean acting in a way that the government regards as illegal. Nonviolent civil disobedience, illegal action of conscience, 
may be a necessary form of resistance to the violence or repression of the state. It is a current issue, given some restrictions on the conduct of public protest in the recent Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act. The peace movement of the 1930s tried to, to make nations take seriously their responsibility for disarmament set out in the Versailles Treaty. A poster from the Northern Friends Peace Board, um, based in Leeds, featured in our Bombs Away exhibition, online exhibition in the pandemic. The biplane might seem quaint, but when it looked like attempts to ban aerial bombing could succeed, Britain objected, saying it needed to be able to bomb the northwest frontier of India, today's border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Then came the Blitz, then came retaliation by Bomber Harris in obliteration bombing of German cities. Bombs Away highlighted those who opposed the targeting of civilians. Human slaughter is never an acceptable way within the just war, whatever the cause, whoever the enemy. Perhaps the real enemy is war itself. The toppling of the Colston statue in Bristol showed us that there are many contested histories in British Britain's monuments. Personally, I contest the Strand statue of Bomber Harris, the man responsible for the mass destruction of civilians. The novelist and diarist Vera Britton actively opposed obliteration bombing. She said that the bombing of civilians, once that was tolerated, atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, lay in the logic of history. And so into the nuclear age. The crown jewels. Gerald Holtham's original 1958 drawings for what in the UK are the, is the nuclear disarmament symbol, but what in the rest of the world is simply the peace symbol, are held by our partners in the Commonwealth Collection, also based in Bradford. We have previously displayed near-perfect copies, but there's no substitute for seeing the original. And in our new gallery, we hope to be able to exhibit the originals with all their crinkles and realism, bringing these incredibly important symbols to life. An active civil society is a necessary ingredient of a culture of peace. And we have examples wherever you look, including a, a builder's helmet, built hospitals, not weapons, no pride in war placard. And we have hundreds of badges. On the right from Leeds CND, Alistair Beale, around somewhere I can't see you, uh, had an amazing project, making tens of thousands of against the bomb badges. There's humor in pursuing peace. I like the badge on the left, art lovers against the arms trade. There are many symbols of peace. A war resistors international symbol of a broken rifle was carved by a conscientious objector in a Greek jail. And this red card, the end, by Masutero Aoba, speaks of the transformation of things of war. It's the logo of our Farewell to Arms exhibition upstairs. Here's on the left one of, the, one of a set of photo montage images by Peter Kennard, sending up pathetic government attempts at civil disobedience, civil disobedience, civil defense in the event of a nuclear strike. The Thatcher Reagan gone with a wind image was an iconic design of its time. We have thousands of posters, many advertising demonstrations against war or nuclear weapons. And there were some huge demonstrations in the 1980s if you were around then, were you there? 
Of course, the biggest demonstration of all, over a million people, was in 2001 against the imminent Second Gulf War. Politicians were deaf to the wisdom of the people, but the scale of the protest was testimony to people's potential receptivity to the message of peace. In contrast to the First Gulf War, civil society heard the case for peace and responded. I believe visitors will engage with stories in the Peace Museum and will respond. We have a fantastic textile collection, mainly large colourful banners, and these iconic examples by Thalia Campbell are from the 1980s when there was a women's peace camp at the US cruise missile base at Greenham Common. And there's a wow factor to some of our banners. Apart from temporary exhibitions, many have not been seen by the public since they were last used on the streets. And we will display more of our textile collection. No militarism in schools is nearly 100 years old. The black banners from Men with Hill and the other two are from Scotland and Wales, full of amazing colourful imagery. A broad definition of culture includes spirituality and religion. Jewish groups in the UK and the US have opposed nuclear weapons. There are many items from the Christian peace movement, including local banners for peace. A banner shows a prayer from the Upanishads, lead me from death to life. And a local collage refers to Islam and Sikhism and others. Even though we have different backgrounds, we are all equal. Not to forget our own, cult, our own heritage as a museum for peace. The first was a war and peace museum in Lucerne in 1902. Here's the guidebook on the left and the story of an anti-war museum in Berlin in the 1920s. And some museums didn't make it. These are from Austria and Chicago on the right. But others are going strong, from Hiroshima and Kyoto to Dayton, Ohio, even Tehran Peace Museum. And of course, the Peace Museum, Bradford. I mentioned Nobel Prize ceremonies. Many objects relate to Nobel laureates. And my favourite object is a beautiful tiny watercolour in a Persian teardrop of an angel sprinkling rose petals onto the earth. There's another peace symbol. Painted by an artist in Isfahan, it was donated to us by Iranian lawyer Shirin Abadi, Peace Laureate in 2003. This too reminds us there are peace people like ourselves, even in countries with harsh regimes. We do not judge people by their government, by their military, or by violent organizations that say they speak, they're acting on their behalf. This year's Nobel Laureate was a colleague of Shireen Ibadi, Najiz Mohammadi, Last year's laureates were human rights organisations in Belarus and Russia. And please think now of Marina Ovskyananikova, who held up an anti-war placard on Russian TV and fled to Paris, and recent reports suggest she may have been poisoned. We acknowledge the courage of those who stand for peace at risk to themselves. We have, seen in the middle, scientific instruments and academic robes of Joseph Rotblatt, who, unlike Oppenheimer in the film, withdrew from the Manhattan Project and was instrumental in setting up the Pugwash Conference of Scientists Against Nuclear Weapons. And we were visited in 1980, visited by the 1980 winner, Perez, Adolfo Perez Esquivel from South America, who asked for a sheet of paper and immediately drew an image of doves overcoming barbed wire, just for us, unique. I mentioned David Hockney, 
the young Hockney and his father went on peace demonstrations in the 60s and 70s and produced their own artwork. This sculpture too, this maquette of doves being released from a hand, was from Josephine de Vasconcellos, whose Bradford Reunion Reconciliation sculpture I mentioned earlier. Objects cover diverse themes that can engage visitors. An Olympic torch from 2012. Various music items were sung by conscientious objectors and others during the First, First World War. So much to look back on, but remembering is not enough. It'll soon be remembrance season, when we remember the horrors of past wars and think of the horrors of present wars, when we consider the human capacity for slaughter, let us also remember people who have spoken out for peace, who have worked for peace, and all that has been achieved for peace by amazing ordinary people who have made a difference even when the clouds of violence seem to be at their darkest. We remember their achievements and find hope. But remembrance is not enough, even remembrance of peace stories. We show peace history in order to inspire people to become a living part of that history, that you yourselves may be active for peace. We hold the past in order to release the future. The Peace Museum is a museum for peace and we want people to be educated, in engaged, inspired and to act for peace in whatever way that means for them, for you. By the way, the uh, Peace Museum is currently hiring um, staff, um, some specialist volunteers, there'll be a general call for volunteers soon, and soon a call for trustees as well. So uh, details are on our website, or will be soon. Looking to the future. We are working hard on the new Peace Museum. We've engaged an amazing team of designers, Creative Core, whose work transformed the Thackeray Museum in Leeds. We will work with them to produce a state-of-the-art permanent exhibition under the headings of Think, Feel, Do. And it should all be ready in time for summer holidays next year. We only ever had a handful of visitors before we now anticipate 50,000 visitors a year, most of whom have never before engaged with peace history or the things that make for peace. We've come a long way since the 1990s, and this is our chance to change the culture. What's more, Bradford has been designated UK City of Culture for 2025. The national press and media spotlight will be on Bradford, its culture and its museums. And the new Peace Museum at Salts will be in that spotlight. So from summer next year, we welcome you to the Peace Museum at Salts. Our objects are peace, a culture of peace is our object. <laughs>